Welcome to the show. In our day and age, it's very important that we find opportunities to be able to develop relationships with individuals who want to find a way to create leadership in positive direction for our communities. Today I have two guests that are here for that particular reason. We have Mr. Seth Copperdale and Ms. Lisa Durden. Both of these candidates are candidates running for the gubernatorial election which will be happening on November the 7th. Thank you very much for participating with me in this segment. Thanks for having us. It's really a pleasure now to know involvement with uh, the type of relationship that you are developing is bringing individuals who are common and everyday to me. Lisa Durden is someone who has been really uh, a part of my lifestyle as I become a communicator. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, now to see her really witness something that I had tried to transcend to a couple of years back is very encouraging and exciting. Mm -hmm. So I looked in terms at how you are actually working to present her and how you brought her on board. Mm -hmm. The thoughts are really conscious in regard to your campaign. There are a number of different positions that you have taken, not different from many of the ones that we are very interested in seeing someone represent. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that you are an individual who have established yourself in the Atlantic Highlands, and now you're really representing an ultra-liberal agenda. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about your expectations, especially when it has to do with the urban community. Okay. So first of all, I'm in Highland Park, which is a little bit different than the Atlantic Highlands, <laughs> um, but, okay. but um, similar in that it's a, a smaller town as opposed to a major urban center. Okay. But I have had a strong progressive agenda my entire life. Um, so yeah, I've been a pastor of a church with my wife in a suburban community that's right on the border of New Brunswick. And we have focused our whole ministry on uh, addressing the issues that matter in our communities. So the things that matter in our community is that there's a lot of folks who have loved ones who are in jail. So we focused on building reentry programs. We serve a lot of folks in our church community who have been homeless as youth. And so we built housing for youth aging out of foster care on the roof of our church. Um, we were irate about the Iraq war and we thought it was a disgusting war to get involved in. We fought against the war, but then we also said in fighting against war, we also need to show support for veterans who've given themselves to this country in the middle of this questionable war. And so we built housing for homeless veterans. That's the way I've, I've carried out my ministry. And every Sunday with my wife, I'm a pastor of a church currently, we say the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And that's the way we've, we've tried to organize our lives. Um, I decided to run for governor because I say it in church and I build it with the ministries that I'm involved in, but then I walk out into a political realm where instead of the last being first, it's always the first are first, are first, are first. Again and again, whether it's a Democrat, whether it's a Republican, it's about lining pockets, it's about taking care of each other at the top, and maybe trickling a little bit more if it's a Democrat in power, a little bit less if it's a Republican in power, but both Democrat and Republican don't trickle nearly enough resources, don't allow for near enough power to rise up from urban centers. So um, I believe that the only way New Jersey will become a place where the last are first um, is if we really have leadership that believes that a wellspring from below is what will transform society instead of this trickle down from the top. And the reason that Lisa fits our campaign um, and why, to be honest, this campaign um, would have been mediocre without finding Lisa is Lisa has lived the last or first message throughout her life and did it in a very provocative and strong and important way this summer. Um, and um, that's what brought Lisa to our attention. And it was the way she communicated the last or first message that made me say and made the campaign say, there's, so, there's somebody in New Jersey who understands what we're about. How do you feel about the campaign trail, Lisa? 
Well, I would like to lie and say I'm having fun, but I'm not. <laughs> um, because people who know me, who watch this show, would know this is my population. I never really wanted to be in politics because I don't like politics. There's several reasons why I don't like politics because most times politicians are liars. Most times politicians make a whole host of promises and they don't keep 90% of them. I'm aware that you can't keep them all because it's unrealistic, but they've just been very disappointing. So I've always been the kind of person that was a person of my word. Uh, and I, I, I have high integrity and good character, not perfect, but I think those are my three um, uh, staples. So I didn't want to be in a position where I'm a politician and I'm saying one thing and doing another. I don't know if it's something that, you know, maybe people go in with the intentions of being great and then they have to lie. I don't know what makes it happen. I'm not inside. So no, I didn't, didn't want to be a politician. Um, so it's not fun running around the state of New Jersey as a politician um, unless you are the kind of person that really knows you can keep your word. So that's the scary part. So, because I'm hoping I said, "Oh Lord, I'm, we're making all these these policies we want to do, and you know, great policies. You know, fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, and making sure we're going to uh, decriminalize marijuana, and make it legal, and all those other things, and education, and and the poor. So I'm always worried that. So it's not fun to live in the in the position of worry. So I, it's fun to meet folks, but it's not fun to say, "Oh Lord, if we get it, I hope I can do what I say." because I don't know that world. So that part is not fun. The worry of that, I really worry about my word. So that's the part that's not fun. Um, but it is fun when I run around and see people like, oh my God, you're Lisa Dern. And, oh, I'm so glad you're on Tucker Carlson show telling about Black Lives Matter and, and standing up for their rights. And I'm running into people like that. So that part is uh, hilarious and fun. Um, so that's the kind of the, the, the struggle I'm having, my internal struggle, not the physical struggle, but the internal struggle of jumping into something new like being uh, a candidate with Seth Copperdale to be the lieutenant governor and if we get in the door can I really do this because unfortunately for me um, I am in my community you you will see me at shot right you will see me at the post office on Filling Hudson Avenue you see me at Dunkin Donuts on Lines Avenue I get approached all the time about things that I'm a part of even when I was uh, the uh, producer of the docu documentary docuseries Brick City when Cory Booker was the mayor some workers didn't love it I got approached in my face about that project they saw me at Pathmark on Lines Avenue. Lisa, we didn't like how you showed Newark and how you only showed the crackheads and you only showed people committing crimes. And I listen to people, so I'm very, very funny about my brand mm -hmm. and my image and who I'm presenting. So I talk to folks when they don't like something I'm doing and I give them that ear. I wasn't the executive producer. I couldn't, I couldn't be on the side of the editing of it. Okay. But, you know, but that's why I was very afraid of putting my word out here in this vein right. if I can't keep my word. I got you. So that was the fearful part. Well, one of the things that uh, come to mind uh, uh, is that, um, you know, your relationship in terms of being part of a political party that isn't mainstream, you know, either you're Democrat or Republican. Right. And anyone in between is usually considered to be a spoiler. How do you think your campaign is going to attract that mainstream voter? to say, hey, let's give these guys a chance. So two answers on that. First of mm -hmm. all, by this point, the spoilers are the Democrats and the Republicans. Mm -hmm. We've been spoiled, mm -hmm. um, not a, only at the state level, but at the national level by the chaos that has occurred by the domination of two parties that um, fight, 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 and we end up with Donald Trump in the, in the White House. Um, you know, the other thing that's spoiled is that 61% of the electorate, uh, the registered voters, did mm -hmm. not come out last time there was a gubernatorial election in the state because they were so sick of the spoiled mess of the parties that were putting forth their candidates. We are, first of all, going for primarily the people who didn't vote last time. We spend almost all of our mm -hmm. time in communities with um, folks who, who are, are not folks that the two parties think are likely to vote. Mm -hmm. And we're saying you should vote because we're actually taking a stand called a last or first that makes sense to you. Um, so that's the first thing. We're going for voters that others don't go for. And secondly, um, we believe right. if Bernie Sanders couldn't have started some sort of a movement in the Democratic Party, then nobody, nobody can. I mean, mm -hmm. Bernie gave us the, the belief that maybe there could be a transformation of the Democratic Party. Um, and it didn't really happen. We ended up with... And they didn't have to look like a movie star. That's right. They didn't have to look like a movie star. Absolutely. Right. And you didn't right. have the most yeah. money. Right. Right. You, you could right. just be somebody who talks yeah. about things that normal people care about. Right. So we think we have the message mm -hmm. that's the most Bernie-like, 
uh -huh. of anybody in New Jersey in a very long time. Um, and, you know, the, the Green Party stands for people, planet, and peace over profit. Mm -hmm. um, if that isn't the mm -hmm. right thing to stand on, what mm -hmm. is? And see, people don't realize that, speaking of Bernie Sanders and why it kind of applies to what we're doing here with the Green Party is, Bernie Sanders, people don't realize this way before we met him now, was on the front line of uh, civil rights the for many, 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 right. many years. Mm -hmm. He was already doing it. It was nothing new. He wasn't interested in anything fantastically different than he's been doing. He was just doing it in a different vein as a candidate. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research when I was looking into Bernie, Bernie Sanders. I'm like, I had never even heard of Bernie Sanders. Um, and I'm like, wait a minute, he's been doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. So the similar to Bernie Sanders True. is one of the reasons why I, I'm not having fun because I'm scared, but I'm excited right. to be running. Right with Seth Capadillas because we've been doing this for a long time right. before we became candidates. You know my past. Exactly. Um, um, uh, Seth, oh, my earring came off. Um, uh, Seth Copperdale has had a church for a long time working with, um, uh, you know, people call undocumented, making sure that he has a sanctuary church, working with individuals who are with young women who are homeless and homeless veterans, and he's raised a lot of money to get a homeless veterans uh, place for them to live. I've been using my voice as, as activism for many years, speaking about those very things that matter to those who are last, speaking about rape culture in America, speaking about Black Lives Matter, speaking about poverty in America, mm -hmm. all and not just speaking, but those individuals who he's talking about, like myself, I always say, in this campaign, I'm the poster child for the last or first. I'm black, I'm a woman, and I'm poor. So whenever I've actually physically been able to touch those people who are last in internships that I've gained for people who went to Essex County College and other schools, women and people of color, I've given them coveted internships on productions. I've given people jobs who went from internships to having a job. I've gone through many schools, colleges, and universities and spoken to students mm -hmm. of color, and not of color too, about how to get into the industry and get into the field. Women in particular try to get into the production field. So I've been touching these people in many different ways that speak to the last. So when you're talking about coming into office and you're looking at creating policies that affect people who are last um, to make sure that we become first, is what was really exciting, exciting and attractive about this campaign. If I were not running, mm -hmm. I would vote for Seth Copperdale. Mm -hmm. If I were not running, I would run for Elisa Durden, not because okay. it's me. I'm going to be honest with you. Right. When it came time to the for the in June, I didn't vote for um, Phil Murphy or the other person. Okay. I voted for um, Jim Johnson. Okay. So I don't always vote for the person who seems like they're the most popular. And it's always in, important in primary, to do what we can yeah. to bring out a message and yeah. let people know who those individuals are. Because in most cases, I wouldn't vote for anybody that I didn't know. And right. the candidates that uh, you know Lisa just spoke of did a really good job Absolutely. of representing a way to contact the media and take the approaches of being and able to come on different uh, programs such as mine yeah. and others. One of the things that really mm -hmm. I wanted to touch on um, is that, you know, Coppedale for governor is a very simplistic and easy way to find you on the internet yes. so that we can look at mm -hmm. the information about the resume of the two of you. Yes. One of the ideas that really came to pass is that we recognize that there are some important values that need to be identified too. And one of the ones that I went across was how you are really looking at a fair tax approach mm -hmm. and not so much on taxing the rich. Mm -hmm. Why don't you share with us the contrast between your policy and the democratic policy? Yeah, if you're going to talk about um, like economic transformation, I think there's really two key pieces. So if you don't mind, I want to talk about single payer health care as mm -hmm. part of this okay, as well. Sure. Um, so I think that the state of New Jersey is bankrupt largely because of the way we deal with private health insurance companies. Um, 33 cents on every dollar spent on health-related costs in the state goes ov into overhead and profit of the health insurance mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. um, we need that money back. Um, mm -hmm. Medicare is a 2% overhead to run Medicare, which is bigger than most countries' entire health care plan. So, uh, and that's a 2% overhead dealing with folks 65 and older the most expensive portion of our population when it comes to health care, right? So if we could move to a New Jersey single-payer <laughs> Medicare for all, we would see a tremendous change in money. Right now, Phil Murphy's talking about $1.2 billion of new taxes. Kim Guardano is talking about trying to find a billion dollars of, you know, um, uh, stuff to cut out of the nonsense around Trenton. 
both of those numbers are so puny that they will make no difference mm -hmm. in the state of New Jersey. We need something like tens of billions of dollars of difference. And the way to get that is through New Jersey single payer Medicare for all. If we had single payer Medicare, every municipality in this state would see property taxes go down dramatically. In my town, 19% of the municipal budget goes toward paying the uh, the unregulated health insurance plans of the teachers and the municipal workers. That's too much for taxpayers to handle. If we had a set rate where we're kicking in a much smaller rate and everyone is getting excellent health care, then that would mean everybody would have more money in their pocket. The rents would go down mm -hmm. because those homeowners who have to pass it through to their tenants wouldn't have to pass so much through to their tenants. Businesses could offer $15 an hour because mm -hmm. they wouldn't have to be paying the unregulated health insurance plans that go up dramatically every year. The if state people, pension, if, if these, yeah. Even if these small, you know, like small businesses, because we know that small businesses is the lifeblood of America. That's mm -hmm. right. So if small businesses like, let's say, a Dunkin' Donuts or um, some, some small hair salon, can That's like right. Seth says, um, instead of cutting people off after 20 hours so they would have to prevent paying you know, health care, they might be a little bit more generous to give you the $15 an hour minimum wage if they don't have to pay into the health care plan right. because everyone gets free health care. Right. Well, looking at yeah. it from a novice perspective, and which is the mm -hmm. reason why I introduced the conversation about taxes, mm -hmm. is that we see now publicly the Republican candidates are attacking the Democratic candidates, saying they're tax and spend, mm -hmm. and they don't want to do anything but find money from the wealthy. And like I said again, I want you to show me some kind of a way in which your fair tax program is going to identify to the relationship of the need and encouraging more participation from individuals who will be willing to look at a difference. Well, let me right. say this so for the rich people. Cause, uh, uh, rich people are not paying their fair share. That's, that's the problem. Right. They're rich not. people are not paying their fair share. Rich people cap out after what five hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. They cap out at eight percent if they make five hundred thousand. We're not even looking at it from this perspective. But like you said, a lot of rich people. You're saying rich people. Yeah. I'm looking at it in numbers. At five hundred thousand dollars, they cap out at eight percent. Exactly. Forty million dollars. There's a seven. At, there's at a five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> they're capping out at dollars. only eighty. Eight, only eight percent. Your well, proposal well, is indicating that right. there should be a fairness in relationship for even that middle income class. What we're saying is mm -hmm. that instead of a seven bracket tax system, Thank you. there right. should be something more like an eleven or a thirteen oh, bracket tax on your system. Yep, how much so you once you hit, if it if at right now it's eight point nine seven at five hundred thousand. Um, once you've hit 750000 maybe it goes up to nine point something. Once and you hit a million, exactly. then it goes million, up to ten. Right. Once it goes up to one point, But not just one flat more. tax exactly. on somebody who is not cap. So you've got... But you they, don't cap, they, don't, they don't cap people they, who are poor. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, we, we, we understand we that. Pay more and the right? logic, again, as yeah. I introduced the fact that I'm novice to this whole conversation, mm -hmm. that the only thing that we keep hearing is tax, you know, yeah, tax, tax the poor. Rich. Tax the rich. Tax, tax the rich. Right. Because the, we're the not paying anything in the, the poor. And the 2% ought to be taxed at a higher level. They're because they are becoming grotesquely <laughs> wealthy <laughs> right. off the backs of the people who mm -hmm. live in the state. So what difference, the what difference as a Green Party candidate versus mm -hmm. a Democratic candidate, what is the... the the really middle road. Well, what I told Phil Murphy is his $1.2 billion tax increase is a puny number, okay. and it really should be even higher. He should not be afraid to tax the 1% and 2%. Um, those folks mm -hmm. should be contributing more to the commons. Uh, a progressive okay. taxation system ought to be progressive mm -hmm. in nature. So I'm not going to apologize for asking the top 1% and 2% to be to taxed more. more. But what I'm saying is taxes is not the way that we're going to change New Jersey. The way we're going to change New Jersey is single-payer Medicare for all. If you want to see a dramatic change in how money moves in the state, instead of talking about a puny $1 billion, if you want to talk about $20 billion of new movement of money, change the, the way you do health care. And Property that's true tax too. is a very strong issue in relationship yeah. Yeah. to this kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And looking at it, especially when it comes mm -hmm. to our institutions, our education, public schools, we have a real deficit. How do you think this is going to be able to help fund education without it being such a burden on homeowners? Mm -hmm. So if you have the health care change that we're talking about, 
and there's dramatic savings in every single municipality. Not only will taxpayers get some money back, but mm -hmm. also there's mo more money for, for public schools. education. Mm -hmm. Also, the state, right now, one of the reasons the state can't pay its pension plan is because the health care for its, its state public workers keeps going up and up and up. It's over 15% of the budget now. Every mm -hmm. single year is just to pay the benefit and health package, I mean, the, the, the benefit healthcare. and pension mm -hmm. plan for, for state workers. Um, the state, if it wasn't pitching so much into mm -hmm. health care, could put more into public education. It could make sure that the school funding formula actually gets funded at the full rate it was supposed to get funded at as set in 2008. And then I think when you take those things away, you take the very thing away that I hate, which is corruption. When you're talking about paying private individuals for health care plans, there's a whole lot of room for corruption. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I dislike about politics because people are always in people's back pockets and, and who's running your state or who's running the country, you know, not the person in, who's in the political office, it's these other individuals who are in your back pocket. So okay. we would not have any fear of, like people say all the time, you know, Joe D's doing this, like these elected officials in the back pockets of these private entities mm -hmm. making money on our backs. Right. So when you take away those private entities, you have no reason for corruption in those areas. Okay. That's how you also save money as well. That's right. One of the things that I think is really important to understand in terms of the lieutenant governorship, this is the second run, the third run, uh, the second time that we have really had a lieutenant mm -hmm. governor in the race. Mm -hmm. And we understand that the position of the lieutenant governor uh, really is an appointment right. by the governor mm -hmm. to a cabinet position. Yeah. Have you decided which cabinet position you would be appointing Lisa to? Yeah, so what we are doing is we're still trying to figure out exactly how that, w that will work. Definitely the types of roles that a Secretary of State would have would be something like what Lisa has. But the main thing that we're talking about is making sure that Lisa is an ambassador for the last or first message. Excellent. The last or first message needs to live in every part of state government. So I like to think of um, Lisa and I together as a team that will make sure that that happens throughout everything. I will do more of the administrating of that, and Lisa would be the ambassador of the last or first message, finding her way into every commission and every assembly and every every um, aspect of state government. So that will be the backbone of it. I think Kim Guardano's mm -hmm. um, role was around uh, specifically uh, business and, and uh, supporting uh, business and, th and things mm -hmm. of that nature. That was sort of her niche. Mm -hmm. um, that will be part of your mm -hmm. niche mm -hmm. in as mm -hmm. much as it has to do with the last well, or first getting, is important getting to small business. Well, yeah, I mean, she she said she's around children state. and families mm -hmm. and race okay. mm -hmm. and all of these aspects. Um, and you know what's Lisa interesting? Be people said that. to me, people always say to people, you know, even here on television, if there was a job that you could do for free and never had to worry about your income and money, what job would that be? Mm -hmm. And people are shocked when I answer, I would not be a talk show host, right. I would not be a film producer, I would not be a, doc not be a documentary filmmaker, I would be someone that would, you know, be a part of a think tank or change policy, go down to Washington DC and fight for the rights of people. I've always said that if I had my rent paid, my mortgage paid, and my money, and I'm in my Jaguar, that's what I would do if I didn't have to worry about money. So this is pretty much what it. I've been asking for all this time. Let me get a couple of more questions. Yeah, in. sure. The state house looks like an abandoned piece of property. Uh, what would you <laughs> do to right fix about that? that? Mm -hmm. Do you think it looks like an abandoned piece of property because of the quality of the property or because of the absence of the people of New Jersey in mm, visiting? That's a good, that's a good <laughs> well, seriously. Actually, actually, I didn't know if there was an absence of people in it, but <laughs> the way it looks, yeah. you have boarded up windows. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just looking like it's just totally deteriorating in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. And there had been a debate in relationship to the cost to renovate it. Right. What would you do? First of all, I think that the, the cost that was being thrown around was so astronomical and out of range for what's appropriate that um, to be talking about that right now when there are so many other things going on was ridiculous. I would like to see a governor make choices about saying, you know, this aspect needs to change, this aspect needs to change, and make smaller decisions. Um, if indeed the property itself needs to be um, repaired. Mm -hmm. But I'm not kidding about the absence of people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the absence of the people. Right. There's the people, certain people, the people who are there. Mm -hmm. There's certain people who are always there. There's certain lobbyists who are always there. Mm -hmm. And there's certain people of a certain ilk and a certain um, level of power. I want the last, our first, to be in Trenton. I want folks who have felt 
left out all the time to be the ones who are there at hearings and they're presenting to their assembly members and senators and being encouraged all the time to fill those halls. As we close mm -hmm. out, it's very important mm -hmm. that we critique the fact that there is an election coming up November the 7th. We're and on line we, D. We have two line D. candidates, line D. And you're, they already have your thing, the things are in the mail already, but they I just came so. out. The they mail orders are coming out? Yeah, the, 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 uh, what do you call those things? The absentee ballots. The, yeah. the, the, no, just the ballots. Oh, just the ballots. Okay. The ballots are already in the mail, so check right. your mail. I saw okay. my name on there, I saw oh, your name on there. That's I just, really interesting. Yes. And it's very really important that you, as an individual, who live in our communities can have an opportunity to be able to voice your concern and to find out more about the candidates that are willing to do something a little bit more than the normal. We want to thank these two candidates. Uh, thank, well, you thank you so for much for having us. It's great. Seth thank you. Copperdale, Copperdale <laughs> and Ms. Lisa Durden. And you better know my name. <laughs> for being able to participate with us in this segment and we really appreciate the time that you've given us. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Mr. Herb. Thank you. Thank As you usual, much. thank you. And thank you for tuning in.